to made new. <laughs> and Sherry used my favorite Hebrew word, hallelujah. By the way, uh, that song was based on a 3,000-year-old scripture song, Psalm 8. I think David, if he could listen, when you get to the kingdom of heaven, Sherry, he would say, I, I like that. He might even get a little bit excited. Get out his harp or his guitar and praise God together. Well, I want to thank you for being here. How many of you are here for the first time at camp meeting this morning, first time this year? Put your hand up. This, Yes, Elder, we have a few here. So we've been having a blessed time together, haven't we? And we're excited that we can continue our study of the Word to go together. Someone asked me, how can you be here? You just did Hope Sabbath School a few minutes ago. <laughs> how many of you have ever watched Hope Sabbath School? Can I see your hands? Honey, look at all of those hands. My wife is the volunteer executive producer. Would you stand up and wave to all of those Hope Sabbath School members? Would you wave back? Look at that. What, what you may not know is several pastors of the Chesapeake Conference are part of the Hope Sabbath School team, and a number of the members of the Chesapeake Conference are part of our team. We're in 200 countries around the world. God is doing amazing things. And I just want to thank you for donating, donating some of your brightest and best to share the word. One time my wife said to me, Derek, Hope Sabbath School is the most important thing you do. I said, babe, I call her babe. I said, babe, I have a lot of other responsibilities. She said, where else do you give a million Bible studies a week? Well, she's always right. I know that. I said, you're right. It's the most important thing I do. And I want to thank you for supporting the media ministry of the Chesapeake Conference. They gave me a tour of their truck. It's nicer than any truck we own. And it's broadcasting, and we have hundreds of people watching via live stream right now. And by the way, if you're here for the first time in this series on Occupy Till He Comes, you can go to the conference Facebook page, and you can watch all of the presentations in this series. So I just want to say thank you to the conference for making that resource available. But right now... I'm going to pray that God would work some miracles. Anybody open to a miracle today? That's why we came. We didn't come to be entertained, did we? We came to hear a life-changing word from the Lord. And so I'm praying, and you pray with me, that the Spirit of Jesus would speak to us right now. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the blessings of this Sabbath day already. We have been lifted towards heavenly courts. And as we continue our worship service, I pray the Holy Spirit would continue to be in our midst and in our hearts that we might understand what it means to occupy until he comes. And I thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, when the president of the conference said to me, Derek, we're going to have a camp meeting, and the theme is Occupy Till He Comes, I had to do a computer search because I'd heard that phrase, but I didn't know very much about it. If you brought your Bible with you, we're in Luke chapter 19. The text is also on the screen for you. I'm going to just do a three-minute catch-up for those of us who are just getting started today. This parable of the Minas is only recorded by Dr. Luke. And it has some powerful insights for each one of us as we prepare for the soon coming of Jesus. So look with me, Luke chapter 19, beginning with verse 11. Now, as they heard these things, he spoke another parable. By the way, if you look in verse 10 at the end of the story of Zacchaeus, it says, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was, that's right. Now, when they heard these things, 
he told them another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. They're waiting for some great triumph over the Romans and an immediate earthly kingdom. But Jesus tells them a parable. I'm reading on in verse 12. If you're following along in your Bible, Luke 19, verse 12. Therefore, he said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. Who is this certain nobleman? It's Jesus. And he's gone to the kingdom, to the far country to receive the kingdom and to return. The story continues. Trying to advance the slide here. We'll preach without the slides unless we can get that working. Now it came. So he called 10 of his servants, delivered to them 10 minas. Now, I asked my wife at first, what's a mina? She said, eeny, mina, miny. I said, no, that's not it. Does anybody know? Well, those of you who've been with us week know, what's a mina? Anybody? It's a hundred days wages, a hundred drachmas in the Greek currency system. He gives about five months wages to each of 10 servants. Now, if you remember the parable of the talents, a little different with that. By the way, a talent was 6,000 days wages. So to one, he gave five talents, 30,000 days wages. To one, two, 12,000 days wages. To one who complained, only 6,000 days wages. We'll find out the problem with that one talent servant and with the servant who had a mean and didn't do anything with it. But he gives in this parable each the same 100 days wages. And the unique thing about the parable of the Mina, and it is the theme of our camp meeting this year, is that unlike the parable of the talents, in the parable of the Mina, Jesus gives a specific instruction. And that instruction is found at the end of verse 13. I'm quoting from the King James Version now, because that's the only place that it's translated this way, occupy till I come. Well, what does that mean? Some of you are occupying a seat. Some of you will take a nap occupying the seat. But to occupy in the text doesn't mean to just sit there. The verb that's used in the Greek, only in this one place, in the entire New Testament, is the verb pragmatuomai. Now, I'm not a Greek scholar, but, but you hear a word there, pragma. Help me now. What English word is, is used there? Pragma. Yeah, it, it, pragmatic, to be practical, to get something done, to be useful. And that is why many translations, including my New King James, say things like, do business until I come, uh, trade until I come. This verb, pragmatuomai, was used for bankers and traders. In other words, get something done with the resource given to you, the working translation we've been using this week. Be productive, Jesus says, in my name until I return. But the question immediately came to my mind, as I began studying this passage, is how does Jesus want us to be productive? And this parable doesn't tell us. It just says, occupy till I come. So I went to the passage that uh, was read for us today in Matthew chapter 10. Again, if you have your Bible, you can look with me in Matthew chapter 10. We've been studying this passage for the past 
three days. Because in Matthew chapter 10, when sending out the 12, Jesus spells out for them some of the things he wants them to do, if you will, to be occupied, to be productive until he returns. I'm reading from Matthew chapter 10, where Jesus says in verse 7, as you go, do what? Preach. We'll see to share good news. Preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, at this point, someone could say, well, that doesn't sound too difficult. Well, we'll learn what the good news is in just a moment. But then it gets a little more challenging. What's next in the text? We need to what? Heal the sick and cleanse the lepers and raise the dead. We talked about that on Thursday night to extend the healing ministry of Jesus. But then last night, what's the next thing we're called to do? to participate with Jesus in setting the captives free. And then finally, freely have you received? So we looked at each of these parts of the text to share the good news. Tell us the good news, that Jesus did not come to what? Condemn us, but to someone say amen. I was so thankful for the testimony of this young lady who grew up with, without fully grasping that, and she felt condemned. I'm so thankful she discovered that Jesus did not come to condemn us, but to? She gave her testimony today. Someone say amen. amen. That was beautiful. Thank you for having a baptism here at camp meeting. But then we discovered that we need to extend the healing ministry of Jesus, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, I guess the ultimate healing is when a person's dead and they get life again. And we're called to extend the healing ministry of Jesus. And we've had some wonderful seminars on health here at Camp Meeting. We had a beautiful service this morning where I don't know how many people came. It looked like more than 50. And there were eight teams of pastors and elders. It was beautiful. Miracles happened this morning. Heavenly blessings came down, not a religious circus, but simply being obedient to the scripture and calling upon the name of Jesus. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. And then Jesus continues in Matthew chapter 10, and he says, cast out demons. And we studied last night, and if you're just joining us for the first time in camp meeting, you can go to the church conference website. You can go to the Facebook page and watch that presentation. And if you do, you might find a free gift at the end of the presentation because we discovered that Jesus not only came to set the captives free, but he wants us to participate with him in setting the captives free. But then we come to the last section, and that's what I want to focus on with you in this part of our study. Freely have you received? Freely. So I have a question for you. What had the disciples freely received? Well, I thought of three important gifts they received. You might come to me afterwards, say, Pastor Derek, I thought of a fourth one, maybe a fifth one, but we're going to at least get started. Freely you have received, Jesus said, freely give. I want to suggest to you, maybe you're taking notes, maybe you're, you're, you're just going to take a mental note of this, but this is important. I believe that one of the greatest gift, gifts that the apostles received and also that we have received is the immeasurable unfailing love of God. Do I have a witness out there? You see, the Bible says in John 3, verse 16, for God so, what? Loved the world that he gave. That word in the Greek is the word agape, love. It, it's self-sacrificing love. It's unfailing 
love. It is immeasurable love. And the Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave. When the Apostle John thought about the immeasurable, unfailing love of God, 1 John chapter 3, some of you have read that text. As he thought about the immeasurable, unfailing love of God, he says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. Would you agree with him today? You say, I know I'm not worthy of the love of God. His love came to me when I was dead in my trespasses and sins. He loved me before I ever knew him. Behold, what manner of love the Father has given to us. And to those who have received his immeasurable, unfailing love, he says, freely you have received, freely give. That's why he told his disciples in John chapter 13, a command that you may remember if you have read scripture. In John chapter 13, Jesus says, a new command I give to you, that you do what? But in case you don't understand the full implications of that new commandment, he continues, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. That means that we are called to love one another with what kind of love? With agape love. We're called to love each other with what kind of love? Self-sacrificing love. We're called to love each other with unfailing love. We're called to love each other with immeasurable love. You say, Derek, how is that possible? And the answer is, it is impossible unless you have first received the immeasurable, unfailing love of God. What did it say in the text? Freely you have received, freely give. It is impossible to love with the immeasurable, unfailing love of God unless we have first received his love. You say, Derek, how does that happen? Romans chapter 5 and verse 4 tells us. We don't have to guess. Romans 5 and verse 4, the scripture says, in verse 5, excuse me. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts. How does it happen? How are we filled with the love of God so we can love as Jesus loved us. How does it happen? By the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So when we ask each day, Holy Spirit, please come, make your home with me. Fill me with your presence. We can pray, fill me with the love of God because the command is given to us. Freely you have received, freely give. I want to challenge myself today, and I want to challenge you to love how? Generously, by the enabling presence of the Holy Spirit. Love generously. If you say, freely I have received, I want to freely give. Let it be said of us as we occupy till he comes, that we love generously by the enabling presence of the Holy Spirit. But I thought, well, what else had they received? Well, besides the agape love of God, they had also received amazing grace. I'm reading from John chapter 1 and verse 14. John chapter 1 and verse 14. And there the apostle John writes, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of what? Full of grace. We learned 
this week that Jesus did not come to condemn us, but to, but to save us. He's full of grace. And the Apostle Paul reminds us what he experienced in his own life. By grace, you have been saved. And his testimony in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 10, I love this testimony of the Apostle Paul. He says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. Is there someone who testified today, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Amen? Would you thank him today that his grace towards you was not in vain? Amen? He could have left you, couldn't he, Melissa, right? He could have left you where you were, but he showed grace to you. And he calls us now to show grace to others because freely you have received, what? Freely give. I was looking at the Apostle Paul's epistles in preparation for this message. I noticed when he wrote to the Thessalonians, he began the letter with this, these words. Writing to the Thessalonians, he says in 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 1, Grace to you. Freely we have received grace. Freely. Grace to you, he says. And peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. But then, then I thought, uh, Pastor Andre, I thought, that sounds familiar. And I went to Corinthians, and he says the same thing when he begins his letter. Grace to you. I went to Ephesians, and the same thing. Grace to you. I continued looking. I went to Philippians. And he begins by saying, grace to you. I went to the book of Romans, and he begins by saying, grace to you. Do, you. do you get the message here? He has received the grace of God. He has been redeemed by the Savior. And the Bible says, freely you've received, freely give. He admonishes Christians in Colossae, in Colossians chapter 4, and verse 6. He says, let your speech always be, what? With grace. I believe that Christians preparing for the soon coming of Jesus, called to occupy till he comes, should be the most grace-filled people on the planet. What do you say? Again, you say, Derek, is impossible. Unless I've accepted the grace, unless I have received the grace. Have you ever met critical religious people? Condemning religious people? Have you ever met them? Don't elbow anybody next to you. <laughs> the reason people are critical and condemning is because they have never fully received the grace of God. That old hymn, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. But when we have accepted the grace of God, I like to call it amazing grace. When we have accepted the grace of God, we will be grace-filled followers of Jesus. We will extend grace to others. They say, I don't know about that lady, but she's so gracious. Freely you have received, Jesus said. Freely give. Show and share God's amazing grace in the name of Jesus. Well, we've looked at two blessings, two gifts, if you will, the disciples had received. The agape love of God. Amazing grace. I chose one more. I know you'll say, Derek, there's another one. But I thought about his awesome truth. You see, Jesus described in John chapter 1, in the text that we read earlier in verse 14, the Bible says that this word who became flesh and dwelt among us was not only full of grace. What does it say at the end of the text? 
full of grace and, and truth. And Jesus, when he was speaking to his disciples, you know this verse perhaps in John 14 and verse 6. He said, I am the way and what? I am the truth and I am the life. Speaking to the religious leaders in John chapter 8, by the way, he would rebuke them. It's possible to be religious, but not to know the truth that sets you free. Hmm? Jesus says in John 8 and verse 32, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And what is that truth? It's in verse 36. If you can see the screen or you have a Bible, we're in John 8 and verse 36. Would you say it with me? If the Son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. Someone say, praise God. If the Son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. That is the truth the world needs to hear. Awesome truth that has been given to us. And so Jesus said to his disciples at the end of Matthew's gospel in Matthew chapter 28. He's sending them out and he says to them, Matthew 28 and verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Now, I want to tell you that Jesus wants us not only to tell the truth about who he is, but also to tell the truth about what he wants to do for us and in us. Are you with me? He wants us to tell the truth that he's coming back in glory. He wants us to tell the truth about what happens when we die so that people are not deceived by lying spirits. He wants all that truth centered in Jesus to be told. So he says, go, teach them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Teach the awesome truth as it is in Jesus. Freely you have received, freely give. And is it not true that not just the apostles, but we also have received the agape love of God. Is that not true? Is it not true that we have also been shown amazing grace? Is it not true that we have also been given awesome truth? So he says to us, freely you have received, freely give. Love generously, my friends. We're talking about occupy till he comes. Let it be said of us that, that these followers of Jesus love generously by the enabling presence of the Holy Spirit. That we show and share God's amazing grace in the name of Jesus. And that we teach the awesome truth as it is in Jesus. By the way, you might say, Derek, well, I'm not a teacher. Well, I want to thank God for my wife. I thank God for her many times. But when we started Hope Sabbath School, I was the only teacher. And then my wife said, it's time to have other young people teach. And I used this. I said, babe, I told you to call her babe, right? I said, babe, there's a million people watching. And my wife said, exactly. That's why you need to do it. Some of them are members of the Chesapeake Conference who are team teachers on Hope Sabbath School. But what's even more exciting is that now there are 10,000 young adults around the world who are saying, well, if Nisha could do it, if Pastor John can do it, if Stephanie can do it, if Travis can do it, maybe I could start an interactive Bible study. It's not about how great we are. It's about how great Jesus is. So we're going to share and teach the awesome truth as it is in Jesus. I met Evie. Well, it's been more than 15 years ago. And Evie gave me permission to share her story with you today. Evie's story goes all the way back to the Holocaust. 
in Austria. An Austrian Jewish father and an Austrian Catholic mother. Not yet married, as they saw the danger of the Holocaust coming, they fled from Austria, from their homeland. They got on a ship sailing to Argentina. Someone here is from Argentina. Where are you? Yes. from. But, but sadly, the Argentinian government would not allow them to get off the ship. And so the ship continued. You know there is a story called, I think, the Voyage of the Damned, where nobody could get off. Can you imagine? They're going back to the place of persecution. Some of them committed suicide. Some of them were jumping off the ship. Praise God, when they came to the island of Haiti, a businessman offered to sponsor everyone on the ship to get off the ship. That, my friends, is a revelation of the immeasurable, unfailing love of God. Amen? Amen. Freely you have received. What? Now, we're not earning God's favor. We're not trying to buy salvation. But we are reflecting the immeasurable, unfailing love of God. Well, her parents ended up in Haiti. And that is where this little, blonde, blue-eyed young lady grew up. She speaks perfect Creole. Anybody here speak Creole? One, two, thank you. Do you know you have to be careful? She was, she was at a rest stop one time, and some people were talking about her in Creole, and she called, talked back about what they were saying. They almost <laughs> fell over. <laughs> Little blonde, blue-eyed lady. So she grew up there in Haiti, but as she grew older, they were practicing the Jewish faith the faith of her father. As she grew older, they were concerned because all of the Haitian boys were quite interested in this little blonde, blue-eyed girl. So they heard about some Sabbath-keeping missionaries there in Haiti, and they heard about a school, some of you may have heard of it, called Forest Lake Academy. Anybody heard of Forest Lake Academy? If you haven't, it's a great school like Highland View Academy. Thank God for our Christian schools. Now, they didn't want her to become a Christian, but they sent her to Forest Lake Academy. That's a picture of Evie, 1957 to 59. Now, I want you, I'm going to zero in on the picture. Does that look like a sad face or a happy face? I want to tell you that Evie Salzman learned about a Savior named Jesus. And she learned that he did not come to Help me now. He did not come to condemn us, but to save us. And thank God for Christian teachers in our Christian schools, because during her time at Forest Lake Academy, young Evie Solzman decided to commit her heart to Jesus. Amen? Just like we saw this morning. But when her father heard about it, he was angry. In fact, he threatened to disown her, to disinherit her, to ban her from the family. Tragically, but I suppose maybe understandably, Evie buckled. She walked away from Jesus. She was sent to a finishing school in Switzerland. And by her own testimony, she went wild. I want to tell you, without Jesus, we are in trouble. She went wild. After three marriages and decades of addiction to prescription drugs, Evie heard the spirit of Jesus calling her. Don't give up praying for your family. If they're still breathing, my friend, there's still hope, isn't there? Well, I want to tell you, I had the privilege of baptizing Evie. <laughs> that day, March 28th, I will never forget because March 28th is my birthday. <laughs> but that's what, not what made it special. March 28th. 
2009 was the 16th anniversary of Evie's sobriety. She had been free from those drugs that bound her for so long. But I want to tell you, that freedom pales into insignificance compared to the freedom that she found in Jesus, her Messiah. She was baptized that day. Now, Evie is an award-winning quilter. Anybody here like to quilt? Okay, a few of you like to quilt. Uh, she had a big uh, exhibition at one of the libraries, the whole sixth floor down there in, uh, I think it was in Hallandale or Fort Lauderdale, Broward County Library, a whole floor. Some of her quilts were $10,000. But she was a gifted quilter. And when she gave her heart to Jesus, she said, I want to use my gift, my mina, are you with me? My mina, I want to use my gift. By the way, you got a gift playing the trumpet. Thank you, brother, for playing. Is that last night? I can still hear that ringing in my ears. I'm going to use my gift. Thank you to the whole brass ensemble here. I'm going to use my gift, she said, to honor my Messiah. Because freely we have received, freely give. So she joined a quilting ministry at Forest Lake Church. They made quilts they gave to people who had children with health challenges, people in a cancer ward, they, to people who'd lost loved ones. That prayer ministry, the prayer quilt ministry at Forest Lake Church has given away to this day over 4,000 prayer quilts. I was blessed to take one to Thailand. A division president was dying of cancer. And, and they said, take one with you, Pastor. Freely we have received. Take one with you, Pastor. And I took a quilt. And I was in an auditorium with, with maybe double the number that is here today. And we had a quilt for the division president, Elder Gulfan. And I said, maybe you want to come up because if you look closely at the quilt, do you see those aren't mistakes on the quilt? Those are little strings. You can tie a knot. It's a reminder to someone who's suffering that someone is praying for her. Someone's praying for him. Isn't that a beautiful thought? Well, I said to this vast group of people, maybe someone wants to come and tie a knot and say a prayer for Elder Goldfein. And it was like a dam broke. I mean, they were running to the front. And I remember one person to this day, she came up. And she started braiding the whole thing. And I, my first thought was, you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to say a prayer and tie a knot. She's like, whoop, 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 whoop. And then I thought, that's beautiful. She is sharing in her prayer to this brother in Christ that she's praying for him. Freely we have received, freely give. Well, Evie talked to me. Just yesterday, she said, Pastor Derek, first of all, I asked her if I could share her testimony. Fourteen years ago, she was baptized. She has been a faithful follower of Jesus, her Messiah, every day since that day. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Though she was driven away, Jesus called her back. Not to condemn her, but to but to save her. She said, Pastor Derek, something exciting is happening. I said, what is it, Evie? She said, well, the, the VA hospital in West LA, she lives in Glendale. She said, the VA hospital in West LA has purchased 125 tiny houses. Anybody know what a tiny house is? It's not a doll house, is it? it <laughs> It's a little house that can be moved somewhere. Some people live in them, right? Um, some of them are quite fancy, but they're small. That's why it's called tiny, right? That's the clue. A tiny house. They bought 125 tiny houses. I said, what are they going to do with them, Evie? She said, 
There are homeless, listen, this is the love of God. There are homeless veterans in Los Angeles, and they have purchased 125 tiny houses to put on their property so that there is somewhere for those veterans to live. Is that a reflection of the love of God? I think Jesus would say, you are not far from the kingdom. They just need to know that whether they realize it or not, that isn't just altruism, but is, it, it is indeed a reflection of the immeasurable, unfailing love of God. Well, I said, Evie, why are you excited? She says, I'm excited because they've given me and our team permission to make one of those prayer quilts. I'm going to go back and show you the prayer quilt. She's going to make 125 prayer quilts with her team. By the way, there was no quilting ministry in Glendale when she got there, so she started one. <laughs> She's trained people to quilt. They're going to make 125 prayer quilts, so each one of those homeless veterans will not only get a tiny house, but they will get a reminder that Jesus loves them with an immeasurable and unfailing love. They will get a reminder through those little knots that someone, even while they were making that quilt, was praying for them. Well, Evie, she didn't say, I don't know how I'm going to do that. I mean, that's a big job. I think maybe I was a little hasty. No, she said this to me. Only Jesus could do this. Amen? Amen. And I want to say that's true for you too. Whatever Jesus asks you to do, as you occupy till he comes. You look at that and you say, whoo, only Jesus could do this. But I'm going to make a commitment today. And maybe you're drawn to one of these three than, than the others. I'm, I'm not giving you a list of things to earn God's favor, but love generously. Who'd say with me today, I want to love generously by the enabling presence of the Holy Spirit. But the next thing you're going to say is only Jesus could. That's right, because I don't have it in myself. Love generously. What about show and share God's amazing grace? Who says I want to show and share God's amazing grace? Not quite as many, but that's okay. <laughs> We're going to have a whole lot of people loving generously, Sherry. That's good, right? Maybe after they see you loving generously, they'll say, how come you love so generously? And you say, let me tell you about the amazing grace of God. What about teaching the awesome truth as it is in Jesus? I know Pastor David, who's our evangelism coordinator, you still here, Pastor David? I'm looking to see you. Maybe you're not here right now. Is there someone? I'm going to raise my hand. I want to. Any Hope Sabbath School people here? All right, we got one. How many of you want to say, I want to teach God's awesome truth? The awesome truth as it is in Jesus. That's a little less than the middle one. So we're going down, but we still got maybe a hundred or two, Elder Lutz, a hundred or two. Imagine what God could do with a hundred or two filled with the Holy Spirit of God saying, I want to teach the awesome truth as it is in Jesus. That you say with me, I believe what I heard today. Freely we have received. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, you've been so good to us. Agape love. Amazing grace. Awesome truth. You've called us. You've called us to not keep that to ourselves to occupy till you come, to, to be productive, Jesus, until you return in glory. Freely we have received. Freely give. May it happen in us and through us, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. It was 800 years ago that Giovanni, he wrote a poem that got put to music. Sherry's going to sing it for us. Come on up here, Sherry. I've been so blessed by Sherry's music this week. It was a prayer. 
You say, who's Giovanni? Well, he lived in a city in Italy called Assisi. They called him Francis. As you listen to this 800-year-old prayer, I want you to see if it's not the prayer of your heart. Freely you have received, my friend. Freely give. We have a closing hymn. We have a closing hymn. 